It is Tuesday afternoon at 4 p.m. in Switzerland and it's Space Cafe Web Talk time. Our Space Cafe Web Talk 33 minutes with Robert Feierbach will begin soon. Thank you for joining us for our talk. Let's have a word on rocket launchers, on today's rocket launchers. As always, we appreciate your participation and your ongoing feedback that is very valuable for us and help us to improve. I'm Thorsten Kreening, your host today and publisher of Spacewatch.Global. We are a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters and the Space Cafe podcast. Some great news for you. Our latest episode, number 25, was released this morning on all the major platforms and features the wonderful Alice Gorman talking about space archaeology. Check it out. It's really absolute worth to listen to. We also keep our friendship open online for you to support us actively and become a space watcher. The edition one has cool items for you, your friends and the ones you love. Your support is needed to keep our work alive. And we do that for you. If you have missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the event section and on YouTube. We host our Space Cafe web talks live weekly. So things can happen when you do it live. My guest today was one of the best bosses I ever had. Okay, that is about 20 years ago now. However, someone who was important for my own career and someone who turned from a boss into a friend or to a friend, not into a friend. So welcome, Robert. Welcome, Robert Feierbach. Robert is the president of Clark Bell Space, a company which was founded in 2004. In his role, or in this role, he is responsible for a board advisory, investment and strategy consulting roles to a global commercial space industry. Robert has delivered successful analysis and business development wins for multiple clients active in the GU to Leo regimes. Robert is also co-founder and CEO of Zero G Launch, a new aerospace company under stealth mode. He is well recognized space um, industry expert, has an impressive track record in groundbreaking satellite technologies and services around the world. And during the past 25 years, he held CEO, CCO, VP leadership positions at EcoStar, SAS Global, um, various Utilsat, Viasat partnerships, Hughes Networks, um, International Division, and last but not least, SpaceX, uh, just to name a few of them. Robert also led the commercial um, launch of the world's first KA spot beam high throughput satellite for Utilsat two way, if I remember right. He holds a bachelor degree in computer science applications um, from the University of Utah and an MBA from the Thunderbird School of Global Management. And with that, Robert, happy to have you here with us today. My pleasure, Thorsten. I hope I didn't miss anything in your in your wonderful uh, and, and great uh, um, um, CV or yeah, bio. However, we wrote in our announcement about 100 companies with launcher ambitions are, are out there. Can you start by giving us a short overview about this current global launcher market? Sure, sure, sure. I mean, I think, you know, when we talk about uh, the launch market today, it kind of uh, makes sense to talk a little bit about uh, what happened in the past and why it is the way it is today, right? So if we look at the past, uh, you know, let's say 15, 20 years ago, uh, the market really was, uh, you know, at least on the commercial side and, and, and even on the government side, was mm -hmm. led by some big companies that pretty much had divided the market among themselves. And we're talking about uh, you know, United Launch Alliance in the United States, the Proton Launcher in Russia that at the time had about 50% market share on all the, all the launches in the world. Uh, then you had Soyuz, of course, which has always been the, the workhorse for both uh, uh, payloads and, and people. Uh, and, uh, and Ariane, obviously, very, very successful uh, during this period of time as well. So 
as we as the as the years went by, we saw the satellite payloads getting larger and larger and larger. So they went from three and a half tons to five tons, and even seven ton monsters being launched. Right, so. That market seemed to be going in that direction, always bigger, 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 and more capable satellites, and then put them in geo, and then have uh, you know have them last 15, 17 years out there, right? Mm -hmm. So at the time, 25 or so launches per year were kind of the norm for commercial satellites, right? Then about 10 years or so ago, SpaceX comes in, right? And and they start claiming that at some point they will become reusable and then they'll go land the, 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 the rocket stages again. And then they're going to much, much lower, lower prices to the marketplace. Uh, uh, lo and behold, they started doing that. Mm -hmm. And what, what happened in, in that case, it really, really disrupted a lot of the kind of steady state uh, development that was going on with these other players. Uh, at the same time, unfortunately for Proton, Proton had uh, quite a few misses there. They had uh, three launch failures in the, in, the, in the space of about 18 months a few years ago, uh, talking uh, close to 10 years ago. So that really, really activated uh, uh, these other players to step up. Uh, and if you look at what happened uh, with that, uh, SpaceX indeed started flying, started uh, uh, generating business uh, and disrupting the pricing in the marketplace. And today they do have about half of the market share. So you can kind of say in a way, the 50% market share the Proton took at the time and had at the time SpaceX now has, right? Now, what has happened over the past five years, five to let's say eight to nine years is that because the, the, the drive to use technologies that are so well developed, like iPhone type technologies, mm -hmm. that you don't need to you know, uh, put in something in space and the CubeSat developers started saying, you know what, why don't we just start launching some of this stuff? Let's start seeing how it works. Let's put in some sensors and things that don't need to last 15 or 17 years or 18 years. Let's put things that will last a couple, three years. Let's experiment, let's see what happens. And that started really, really driving, driving demand for uh, the, small, the, the smaller launch vehicle markets, uh, and uh, and you know, en entering that with uh, some very, very cool innovations as well in terms of not only sensors but innovations in terms of the kinds of things they wanted to provide for software as a service, right? Mm -hmm. And today there's some very, very strong players in that software as a service. And analytics as a service marketplace, which are driving the marketplace, especially in the in the optical sensor and and uh, uh, you know imagery markets that are providing some incredible incredible products to the marketplace. So today, if you look at now the launchers that had to kind of step up to be able to respond to that marketplace, there are about 100. I counted them just uh, this morning again, just to make sure that I had the right the roundabout figure. 150 companies are active in developing launchers around the world okay. today. That is a crazy number, you know, as you know, and as I think all the listeners know, uh, not uh, very many of those will make it. The, the, the kind of roadways and the, and the runways to, to launch a, a, a rocket launcher is, is, uh, uh, is very long and very expensive, uh, something in the order of $100 million for, to, to be able to have any kind of viable launch system. Uh, mm -hmm. So clearly a lot of these companies will make it in the future, but bottom line, 150 companies worldwide, and that's a that's a huge number. When you think that you know, a few years ago there were basically four or five launchers worldwide, that were the ones the ones that were most active, right? But I mean, this taking this huge number aside, and I'm I'm with you. Not all of them will make it. But what differenti differentiates this company? Let's take the 50, the first 50 in in, in the line with the most development. Or most recent developments. So, what is the difference? I mean, are they all aiming for the same market, same material? I mean, is it more of the same, or is it really innovation? Yeah. Well, I, I think you have to look at it a little differently because, uh, as we said, the satellites were getting much, much larger and uh, multi-ton satellites. But today, mm -hmm. the real driver for the marketplace is really the small satellite revolution. Small satellites. Uh, multi-kilogram to a few hundred kilogram kind of uh, payloads, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if you look at what how these companies differentiate themselves in the marketplace, you say, say you pick even the, the top 25 today, mm -hmm. you'll see that it's they differentiate themselves by the capability of, of their mass to orbit. So some of them will be in the one ton category, 
Some of them will be in the uh, kilogram category, category, anywhere from, you know, 15, 20 kilograms, all the way to 300 to 400 kilograms of mass lift capability. The other differentiator for them is uh, some of them are, are many of them. In fact, the biggest part of the marketplace is vertical launch, you know, traditional mm -hmm, vertical mm -hmm, launch mm -hmm. from a spaceport kind of thing, uh, which, uh, you know, is, is a model that's been practiced since the beginning of, of, of spacefaring uh, or spacefaring activities. So, um, you know, you use liquid propellants, some of them use solid propellants. Uh, uh, but uh, the, 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 you know, you, it, it allows you to, to, to develop vehicles that can now can be very, very small and inject some payloads in the, in the, uh, uh, in the, in the precise orbits that all these uh, different players want. But then you have some that are going into the horizontal uh, launch category, right? You see uh, Virgin Orbit and Pegasus, for example, it's been around for a long time. Uh, those, uh, the differentiator there is that they can launch above the clouds and the pitch is we can launch above the clouds and we, therefore we go over the weather uh, and therefore we don't have to have uh, any kind of delays in launch and your launch window uh, that has been assigned to you, right? But then the other real differentiator here is the price per kilogram. And today, mm -hmm. in today's marketplace, when you look at the, all the small satellite manufacturers and the, and the payload uh, uh, people, that are want to launch small constellations of five or 10 or even 100 or plus satellites, the price per kilogram is really a key for them because that determines how much you can put up there and what kind of instruments you can carry to space. So, you know, right now, the price per kilogram differentiator is very strong for some of the players. For example, SpaceX now that's been, you know, active for, for a long time, uh, they introduced a rideshare program for $5,000 per kilogram. That really is disruptive when you think that it's a big launcher that typically carries, you know, big satellites to space, to geos and to other orbits, but they're now saying, you know what, we're going to launch Starlink satellites. And each time with the starting size, we'll have a couple hundred kilograms for you guys. And we'll sell that at $5,000 per kilogram. So that's really energized mm -hmm. a marketplace and it's opened some new markets. For example, um, you know, you have the, the, the uh, you can small, you, you know, sort of a, a launcher like SpaceX can launch um, a constellation at a time or, 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 or parts of constellation at a time, but not to the exact desired orbital destinations, right? So that's, you know, typically uh, when, you, when you have a, somebody that's a co-passenger, Somebody has to integrate that mission and then deliver your payloads to uh, to 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 the orbits that they have launched to. So you have integrators like Spaceflight and ISIS and ExoLaunch in, in Europe that uh, will you know deploy those for you uh, wherever you're released by by the, the SpaceX uh, vehicle, the Falcon 9. But then the market that's come up from that is the market for space tugs, or some people call them space taxis or orbital transfer vehicles or whatnot like the orbit, like uh, Momentus, like Astroscale, uh, Moog, Ex uh, Exolaunch, Atomos Space. There's a big list of those now that are saying, ah, what a wonderful thing. Thank you, SpaceX. You're, you're giving us, a, 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 our customers, a launch for $5,000 per kilogram. Now we'll take those satellites from that orbit and we'll take them to where they really want to go for a nominal price, right? Yeah. So that's opened a whole market for them as well. So it's, yeah, a, it's think, a really interesting to see how to see how it's developed, right? You know, I mean, but the price per kilogram is key. I mean, you're talking absolutely. five, you know, the PSLV rockets today are in the twelve to fifteen thousand dollar range per kilogram, and then you have other launchers that uh, uh, the small ones are in the twenty five to forty thousand dollars per kilogram. So that's how they kind of look at their marketplaces and their clients, right? When I made the calculation correctly, our RFR, uh, Rocket Factory Augsburg, just announced our Three million or euro for right. uh, their payload. I think it's a ton. Or I mean, that would be even below that. Yeah. Very disruptive. Uh, that would be on, very, on, very disruptive. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. Let's let's see um, if that will happen. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, as you mentioned, our Exo launch this morning. We are um, published their news that they are going out now, also for space tax, as you as you mentioned. So, exactly. but let's focus on the. Uh, on the launcher um, or for, for a short talk here. Are there difference also in, in material or is it, again, more of the same? And what role maybe plays also 
3D printing. I mean, when I had the chance in the previous life, <laughs> when we all could travel and, and um, go abroad or uh, to see the production facility of um, Virgin uh, Orbit, and they had these huge, impressive metal uh, 3D printers there. And I mean, where are we um, in terms of material and, and 3D printing? Yeah, well, one thing that's really changed a little bit, or I guess uh, quite a bit, not just a little bit over the past uh, five, 10 years is the introduction of different materials, as you say, Torsten, mm -hmm. to the manufacturing chain. It used to be we manufactured rockets out of metal, basically, uh, mm -hmm. almost exclusively, right? Well, the, some of the small launch uh, category launchers are using carbon fiber construction and spinning carbon fiber around to create these nice, very, very strong structures and rocket stages. So uh, it, those strands give you strength, but it isn't a cheap process. You know, it gives you a nice light structure, but it's not very, very cheap to get it done. Uh, the metal cores uh, are gonna be typically a little bit less expensive if you can uh, get sort of the production like an auto industry manufacturing process in there to build them cheaply. But there's also other things, right? Uh, you're looking at the uh, carbon fiber versus metal, but then you also have the introduction of um, uh, turbo pumps, which were typically propellant uh, fed to now battery fed. So they're electric turbo, uh, electric pumps to create the pressure in the, in the combustion chamber, right? So that's new. And how does that come about? Because uh, you have next generation batteries that are much, much lighter mm -hmm. and much more efficient now that good, allows you to, you know, you have that mass penalty of the, of the batteries in there, but the the benefit of not having to have, you know, a whole system with combustion uh, separate from the main system to be to 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 get your pressure up in your in your combustion chamber. So, and then you have other things too, right? You have uh, in the separation of first and second stages. That separation device could be pyrotechnic or it could be mechanical, uh, pneumatic, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so as you've seen, there was a video the other day of Rocket, uh, Rocket Lab, the separation of their, mm -hmm. uh, of their, their second stage, and they showed this little mechanical device just separating the stages, right? Uh, so that's, again, mass penalty because the mechanical device will weigh more. Uh, pyrotechnics, you have the explosive device, which is very, very small. But you can't test every explosive device. You do a yield testing, so you can test you can a test it once. yield of 100. Right, you test a batch, <laughs> and then you hope that the one you chose to put in there is going to be good, right? So all those things make a difference in how you build your rocket, right? And then, uh, you know, yeah. sometimes and, and plus, uh, look at how many rocket engines you put in underneath there, so that if one or two fails, you can still have a nominal mission versus putting mm -hmm. one or two large rockets in there. Uh, if it fails, it fails and you lose your passenger, right? So Absolutely. those are kind of the things that are happening in the material uses of, of, of rockets, right? Okay. So, I mean, let's talk about the the purpose of these launchers. I mean, these huge market that, that you address. I mean, are they all pure commercial or are they also providing fast responses so military purposes? And if so, how does or ITAR plays a role in that. I mean, everything rocket was at least in the in the in the old time are uh, a dual use purpose. So, I mean, many of those companies out of the 150 are based out of US. So it's not an issue. But uh, I think a good number are overseas. We have some in Europe or Germany or uh, UK or where else or. Um, France, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Italy, well, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, if, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, the purpose of the launches is, of course, to get payloads to space. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the, a lot of the new generation launchers are responding mainly to commercial uh, customers, mm -hmm. commercial launch uh, customers. So, so, uh, but, but as you will see uh, from their manifest, uh, some of the government clients are also using them now, right? So the government clients are not mm -hmm. just using the government launchers. They're using commercial launchers now because they're saying, hey, you can do it and you can respect our ITAR, ITAR guidelines and, uh, and procedures to protect those. And of course, there's a paperwork involved that has to be done uh, in, a, in a certain way under ITAR rules with separate computers, separate uh, communication systems. But that's something that's manageable, right? And then you even see uh, you know, payloads that are being deployed by you know the PSLV in India, for example, that is being very successful. Um, you know, 
So what do you do there? The, you basically provide them with interface control documents, which show them where they need to attach and where they go, but you don't give them the rest of the information, right? So you can manage that process by basically giving clear ICDs without having to give the whole, uh, the, your whole technology part away. And, you know, obviously uh, the, the, some of the new players have to deal with uh, with government customers. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure some of the German launchers, for example, that are upcoming and, and, and making developments will also have some government customers. So they will have to follow a similar procedure uh, as, as to ITAR that we do here in the United States to, to kind of integrate those, right? So, you know, uh, I think um, um, if you look at uh, the, the need for responsive launch, it's really, really here with so many, so many satellites. Uh, I think the last time I counted, there's 50,000 plus satellites that already have received or frequencies uh, by either the ITU or the F FCC. Can you imagine over 50,000 satellites have already received those? Now, not all of those will launch, uh, likely, but that's a crazy, crazy number when you think of the amount of number of satellites that, that uh, we are tracking today, around 25,000 or so uh, total, uh, mm -hmm. and maybe 4,000 active satellites, 4,000 plus active satellites. We're going to have 50,000 in the next 10 years, potentially, that have already received frequencies. That's a crazy number. So, so that 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 really uh, uh, pushes the industry to say yeah, we have to do something here to regulate it, to to manage it, to to structure uh, how this is going to happen because it can't be the wild west. Obviously, it just can't be, right? Absolutely. I mean, as we just had a look into the business plans, or as you as you just mentioned, or what is their potential? So, um, I think we also covered so who are potential clients, but. Let's ask the, the ugly questions. I mean, we are all excited about launchers and rockets. And I mean, um, that's what drives us in the industry, but more launchers, more launches, more satellites, as you said, more debris, yeah? more potential um, collisions. I mean, we have seen it a few days back, or I mean, 60 meters between one web and, uh, and a, our Starlink satellite is not that much. So what about, space traffic management, SSA. So how how can we manage it? I mean, I had a talk on, on, on SSA with Darren McKnight a few weeks back and he offered in, he calls it the Coca-Cola model that you deposit some money and if you don't clear, clean your, your, your orbit, then, uh, um, or you get your money back when you clean your orbit. I mean, that's at least an interesting thought, but we are, I think, far, far away from it. What is what do you think? Or what what is your point on it? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, uh, the large launchers and the medium launchers and the small launchers uh, are all uh, you know going after the marketplace right now for some of them constellation launches because that's going to really drive the num large numbers. And you've seen a few players now saying, hey, you know what? We've been doing the like Rocket Labs. We do we've been doing the small launch market, uh, but we will grow up to the larger. Market, but right? Let me jump in here on the on the large constellation. If we take Starlink, yeah, obviously completely launched by Elon himself. I mean, just with, with the other pocket, but however, still Elon's company, and Kuiper. I mean, we see. I think this is it tomorrow or the uh, new Shepard, uh, at least right. on the on the launch pad. Yeah. So I'm not sure if they want to fly or is it just a firing test, but however they will launch their own constellation as well. So what remains are constellations like OneWeb or so, but these huge numbers, these 50,000 you mentioned, I mean, a lot of them are in the two other constellations, which coming with their own launchers. Well, that's correct. I mean, if you look at the, at the case of uh, SpaceX, definitely. Kuiper, mm -hmm. uh, debatable whether they will use their own launch for that mm -hmm. or not uh, exclusively. Uh, my my sense is that they will disperse a little bit uh, the, the the launch uh, uh, providers, but uh, if you look at the other ones, uh, there are you know uh, dozens and dozens of companies that are launching anywhere from 20 to 100 satellites for their own little uh, constellations that are uh, as I mentioned you know you look at uh, people like Spire, uh, people like uh, 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 um, uh, you know Planet and so forth that have a couple you know 100 plus satellites out there and they have to constantly refresh them because we mentioned before some of these satellites are not lasting very long they're there for three years four or five years in orbit maximum so they have to constantly refresh them and that allows them to put the latest and greatest technology 
in the refresh, but they have to continuously launch those, right? So, but going to the SSA part, um, again, I mentioned, you know, there's about 26,000 objects that we're tracking today with about 4,000 active satellites. But if you look at the, and, and these are 10 centimeter uh, plus objects that we're tracking, right? Mm -hmm. If we look at the next layer down below, and we're talking about, you know, what happens when once you are, your second stage goes to space and it's just floating around space there, what happens after that? Well, the paint chips start cracking with the, with, with the sun and a little paint chip now comes out and it's, it's traveling at, you know, basically uh, at uh, uh, 28,000 kilometers per hour, right? And when a paint chip hits something at 28,000 kilometers per hour or a small bolt or even uh, a little bit of... Uh, propellant that hasn't been, that has leaked out of that stage, that is now a missile traveling at mm -hmm. 28,000 kilometers per hour. So if you look at that number of objects there, again, this is not something we're tracking, but we're estimating there's about 600,000 objects yeah. in the one to 10 centimeter category. Then you go to the next layer down below, the millimeter category. Millimeter category, we're, we're estimating about 150 million objects out there today. That's a crazy number when you think about it, Tosin, right? So how do you manage that? How do you, uh, how do you uh, detect those? How do you catalog those objects? Well, there are a few companies that are trying to do that. Uh, you know, I'm putting radars around the world. Uh, you have uh, companies like Leo Labs, and then you have uh, some companies like ExoAnalytic that are buying data from multiple uh, uh, providers. You have GMB in Spain, uh, AGI and others that are trying to provide analytics by amassing data from multiple sources, try to give you the best possible uh, um, tools to manage your constellation and manage how you move in, in that space. But it's difficult, it's not easy. And uh, you know, again, the governments have their own sensors and radars and things like that, but um, governments don't want to share data on their you know, special objects they have there, you know, especially defense, course, defense yeah. objects. Yeah. So, Obviously, that data will always be a little bit uh, incomplete because of missing objects, right? Uh, Even if so, you see it, you, we don't tell you that it's there. So correct. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went I went into one of these uh, control centers uh, of one of these players uh, not some time ago, and then I saw what is that one that shows a kind of a zigzag there? What what is that? And it goes, oh, well, we can't tell you what it is, but uh, it's obviously. Uh, one of uh, one of the defense birds that was actually moving east and west, east and west. Oh, so, times. You, so you have been in the in the Luch Center, yeah? In the... uh, yes, I've seen some <laughs> of those things. So, so, so obviously know that there's you some have that good connection to Russia. So, but yeah, well done, well done. <laughs> uh, I think the SSA will, or, or the space traffic management, will keep us busy for a, a period of time because I mean, our, it doesn't sound that like, that you have the ultimate solution as well. So, what is unfortunate. Yeah. I thought we can disclose it here today. So let's talk again, we are, we are back on the launcher market, not on the object. So, and I think we, we also have to differentiate there. I mean, there are a number of, of second stages, as you said, still up there, which are causing obviously a huge problem because by their sheer mass. So, but the way forward, um, are we, what is your point? Cheap systems versus re reusable systems? So well, uh, burn it or get it back. Yeah, I mean that has a little bit of an impact on on the issue we just talked about, right? SSA, yeah. because you know, basically an object around the 500 kilometer kilometer orbit will nominally deorbit around 25 years, right? But if you look at an object in the 800 kilometer orbit, just a little bit higher yeah. than the ISS, and twice as high as the ISS, that mm -hmm. will stay there for about uh, a couple hundred years. Yes. Imagine that. And if you go to just a little bit higher to 1200 kilometers, 1200 only, it's going to stay there for 2000 years. So it's really, really key that we try to bring things back, not leave them up there. I think reusability is an important thing. Uh, so as, you, as you've seen, there's some players doing that. SpaceX is certainly trying to do that with the uh, first stages. Uh, they haven't done that with second stages yet. Uh, Rocket Lab is trying to do that with their systems as well. I think reusability gives you that responsibility to be able to bring things back and not just leave them up there. But it really comes to getting some guidelines, I think, for these other, you know, 150 mm -hmm. manufacturers that are out there producing things. How should they be allowed to launch something to space, right? At a very, very minimum, 
And this is something that we're talking here in the industry among, you know, among regulators and, and, and the forums that I attend so forth, is at a very, very minimum, you should have some guidelines for a satellite manufacturer that says, you have to have maneuvering capability so you can move out of the way if you need to yeah. in space. And you must have an end of life to disposal program, right? You mentioned maybe everybody get, donates a little bit of money so that uh, you can clean up space, but nobody wants to clean up space today, especially if you launch something 50 years ago, you're not gonna go out and clean it up for anybody else, right? So, so the, you have to have some guidelines. Space is very congested today, but reusability is one way to get there. Cheap systems make sense as well. Uh, I mean, if you can launch something very, very cheaply and the first stage falls in the ocean, okay, the ocean gets polluted, of course, but as long as you're not using toxic chemicals and things like that, maybe that's okay, right? Because you need to respond to the marketplace as saying, launch me, launch me, launch me, and launch me at a cheap price, right? So, uh, <laughs> you know. As, as a newcomer that we are talking here about, taking that into account, taking care of it, using non-toxic propellant, using whatever of these ideas might might apply, or is it just put it together, launch it, it's cheap, get some money and, and run? Well, I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of sensitivity to that today. So they are okay. trying to respond and trying to be responsible and saying we're, we're using green propellants rather mm -hmm. than toxic propellants, especially for uh, for uh, upper stages that typically have used very, very toxic propellants. But uh, so, yeah, now how many of these are and how quickly some of these will actually start implementing and actually using those non-toxic propellants for, for complete first stages still remains to be seen, but they're, they're paying lip service to it. And they're, st they're saying, yes, we're going to that route. Yes, we're, going to, we're mm -hmm. responsible. Yes, we want to be cognizant that we can't pollute the whole earth and then leave things out there, right? So um, obviously the Western, more Westernized players are more sensitive to that. Uh, some of those non-Westernized players are not so sensitive to that today, right? But that's just the way it is today in the marketplace. Yeah, I'm not sure who you're talking about, but I'm. I will. I will look. Uh, you can look it up later. Um, <laughs> let's spend these the last minutes um, on where to launch from, because I think that's a not unimportant element of the entire equation. You have to have a place where you launch your rocket for, for, from. I mean, it can't be your garden, um, as, as long as you're not living somewhere in the desert. So let's talk about a, a spaceport. So how does the spaceport market looks like um, and what countries are, are ready for that? I mean, we have a number of initiatives here in Europe, absolutely. And then there comes a but. So um, do we have enough launch port? Uh, launch pads, launch ports, well, uh, space ports for all these launchers? I think that actually depends on what country we're speaking about. <laughs> because if we speak about the United States right now, there are actually 12 licensed spaceports in the United States yeah. today. Wow. There's a 13th mm -hmm. that is applying for, uh, for uh, a spaceport license as well in the north of the United States. Uh, you know, most of those 12 spaceports in the United States uh, are for horizontal launch, but there are enough horizontal launchers yet out there. That means they're inland, they're not on the, on the coasts, right? To be mm -hmm. able to launch over the ocean. Um, and I think there was a bit of a, a rush, you know, for vehicles that could be reusable and kind of a space shuttle type vehicles a few years ago. So all the spaceports, spaceports really ran to get themselves licensed there. But, uh, but you know, a spaceport has to have uh, the, the regulatory environment, has to have the, you know, be, be able to, to, to open the launch windows uh, in, a, in an easier way. Uh, an easy way to, easier way to do that, of course, is launching over the ocean because you're not launching yeah. over cities and you want to, the environmental analysis will be easier. Uh, the launch window uh, will be easier to obtain. Uh, but then you have to have a propellant handling needs and the pressurization and hypergolic uh, systems. But then you look at the uh, sites that are nascent in Europe, for example, like UK and Scotland, and of course, uh, places like Norway and Sweden, uh, they're well positioned because then they're launching northwards, so basically over the ocean as well. So they're well positioned to be able to do those things. I, I, I think that, um, you know, especially with the small launch industry, uh, there are several spaceports that are uh, that are setting themselves up to be very busy in the next few years in Europe as well. Uh, of course, you have other sites in Brazil and in Canada that are trying to do the same. 
uh, India and China are building mm -hmm. are building quite a bit of extra diversity, meaning uh, more more launch sites, especially in China. So yeah, the world is realizing that uh, launch is important, and uh, of course Australia is another one that is trying to get into that business. I think the demand is strong enough that everybody wants to get on the bandwagon, basically. But you have to have you know the infrastructure. It takes time. And you have to also be able to clear those launch windows easily and then mm -hmm. and then not not damage the environment nor people uh, along sure. the trajectory of those rockets right so that's important i'm afraid we're running out of time i mean even with was already delay in the start um so but let's take one or two questions here um i would like to pick up one question here from michael michael maloney thanks for 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 uh, for that one Yes, we focus too much our, on spacecraft when discussing debris. Over half of the statistical significant intact debris objects are rocket bodies. So should the launch industry be required to remove their upper, I mean, their upper stages? What is your point on that? I mean, you touched it a bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a really good um, uh, intention to want to do mm -hmm. that, but it's not so easy, technically speaking, right? Because you have an upper stage in, in some pretty high orbits that release their payloads uh, to, uh, on transfers uh, to other to other uh, destinations. So bringing those rockets back uh, would require quite a bit of extra propellant uh, to, to slow down uh, the vehicle, uh, retrofiring, and then to try to bring that, that object back. But I think at some point, we have to go in that direction saying, well, what is feasible? Just how much mm -hmm. should we act these these players to to be able to do? Uh, should there be maybe if you release a vehicle at this altitude or that altitude or that altitude, then you must bring it back. If you go beyond that, then maybe there's some other things that you need to ask for them. But it is expensive, and it does uh, impose a, an extra mass penalty because you have to carry extra propellant and you have to uh, you know get those vehicles uh, brought in uh, at a, you know at a certain angle so that you don't you don't you don't uh, bring them over populations and such so it's a complex thing but uh, certainly as more launchers come up come, come up uh, just like we spoke about debris yeah. uh, out there there uh, for maneuverability of rockets i mean of satellites and so forth there's going to be a lot of discussion in that direction too but it's expensive and uh, technically complex right or we re reuse them in in space yeah or recycle them in space another uh -huh. idea that came up so uh troy we will miss the uh, discussion on the space sustainability rating uh but if you guys are gonna join us on clubhouse right now in in 30 seconds or so so as soon as we are done so um we will pick up on that uh, and or continue our talk because i'm afraid we are now over here our production team is waving their red flags already. Um, Rob, be assured and all of you be assured, we will talk about our launchers and the entire market in our future space cafes and in our web talks. So quick run, um, what you can expect from us uh, later this week, tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, European time, uh, we run our second Space Cafe Brazil. Um, Ian Grossner will have Alia uh, Raquel um, as his guest on 15th or on Thursday at 6 p.m. or at CEST. We have our second Space Cafe Summit, our, um, Occupying Space. Where are we going? So Marcus Payer, our editor-in-chief, will talk with Professor Pascal Ehrenfreund, Dr. Peter Martinez and Con Hodgkins about these topics. The week after, uh, we start with the second uh, Space Cafe UAE um, during the Ramadan. Uh, so Ramadan Karim pro to our um, friends are in the Middle East right now. On 20th, uh, I will talk, so next Tuesday, I will talk with Teresa Hitchens about Star Wars or Star, um, Star Trek, so the future of military space. On Friday, we will or start our first Space Cafe Greater Bay Area, China in this case. So the Hong Kong area, uh, Macau and Shenzhen. Um, so that will be hosted by Blaine Corsio, an undisputed uh, expert in China space activities. On 27th, I will have a chat with uh, Chris, Professor Chris Welch from the ISU about sp art in space. And on 29th, we run our first Space Cafe Scotland, hosted by the wonderful 
Angela Mattis. So we will have a busy month ahead. Um, hope to, you will join us. All events are going to be online on Eventbrite. As always, we would like to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly newsletters. And if you like to treat yourself with something special, become a space watcher. And I'm a bit disappointed, Robert, that you are not wearing your Space Watcher t-shirt today. So <clears throat> next time, I count on you. Uh, so we keep our fan shop open. So take a credit card and go to shop.spacewatch.global to get your own one. And I know, but we need your support. So thank you very much for your interest today. And thanks, Robert, for the inspiring talk and being my guest. And thanks to the entire team are behind the scenes for doing their great job. Uh, week by week again i hope you all would stay safe and stay safety stay stay safe and healthy not safety thanks for joining us hope to see you next week in the meantime visit our website or follow us on social media or see you on clubhouse in a moment and don't forget become a space watcher thank you very much thank you robert thank you